Okay, I'd like to uh, thank God for all who have joined us this morning. I also would like to uh, thank Derek for the announcements that he made up on last week, expressing the elders thinking and their and our concerns about going back to the building. Uh, I'd like to let you know that uh, we don't really subscribe to some of maybe the negative comments that you might hear floating around. Uh, we do take this very serious and we do listen to those who have gained our trust, uh, like the experts, to help us with our decision. Uh, we want to be part of the solution in our situation and not part of the problem. We take a very conservative and cautious steps. We're going to take that in, on a, in our return. And our lesson this morning is going to be somewhat centered around those thoughts. I also like to thank Rex for his lesson last week. Uh, some of the points he spoke of in that lesson on uh, showdown uh, it could be and should be considered also in this lesson. If you didn't hear that lesson, that's on our website and it's also on YouTube. This morning lesson is going to be a very brief lesson on three different phrases that we find in the Bible. And we're going to look at some of the words in those phrases. And we want you to consider uh, what those words might mean as far as the message that we might be that we might get from these phrases or these words and how we might be able to apply though that message to our life. I said brief lesson because of the fact when I was putting this lesson together, uh, Judy asked me, is this going to be one of those hour long lessons? And I told her, I said, I'm having a hard time getting 30 minutes out of this lesson. So no, it's not going to be an hour long lesson. Um, what I want us to do is consider the three phrases that we're going to be talking about this morning. One of them read in your midst this morning in Philippians, and most of our uh, study and quotes going to be coming from that book of Philippians. In the 11th verse of that verse, Paul talks about, in my version, it says, whatever state, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit. And then we're going to be looking at another phrase in Genesis 22 two and eight god will provide and then we're going to uh, talk about in hebrews 10 25 our assembly so we want to consider these three factors this morning uh like i said my bible says whatever state you're in but in some of the other versions it talks about what circumstances what's the circumstance you're in and then some of them says situation positions and conditions all of these are some of the different versions that different Bibles have. But when we look at it every, and I, I'm gonna be inter, interchanging these words as I go through the lesson. So every situation has a story of, on how we got to where we are. When you look at where you are now, there's a story to how you got to where you are. And we're gonna be looking at that. Uh, Sometimes the choice, we, uh, it's, it's, it's the choice we make. That got us sometime in where we are, good, bad. Sometimes it's that choice, but sometimes it's the choice of, that someone else made. And then it's sometimes it's just things just happen beyond our control. But even as at that, if we look back somewhere along the line of that story, somebody made a choice. I want to share a situation with you very briefly here uh, to kind of set up the uh, foundation of what we're talking about. I want to share with you a, a story that happened to Judy and I some time ago. Uh, Judy told me don't embarrass her, so this is a, her embarrassment. She shouldn't have never told me that. But anyway, the story that I want to share with you that long time ago, Judy and I used to go to Las Vegas to watch the grandkids play ball. And on this one occasion, as we were returning back to California, one of the parents wanted to ride with us. And as I was making my way back to California, I followed the wrong sign. I got on the right highway, but I was going in the wrong direction. And as we were driving along this highway, Judy kept saying, 
we are going in the wrong direction. And I said, no, we are not going in the wrong direction. I know what I'm doing. I am going the right direction. And so as we continue to drive, she would look over and she said, well, I don't remember seeing that. And I don't remember seeing that when we came in. So I would look over and I would say, oh yeah, I remember seeing that. I remember seeing that. And so as we continue this, um, I'll call it a little debate, our passenger, our parent, we ask her, well, what do you think? Are we going in the wrong direction? Or are we going in the right direction? And so the parent says, uh, uh, you know, basically, I don't want to get involved in this little discussion that you guys are having. Wherever you go, um, th that's where I'm going to be. So the parent didn't want to get involved in this situation. So we drove about an hour and we came up on this huge sign. And this sign said, welcome to Utah. How do we get there? Let's look at some ways, how do we get there? Well, I followed the wrong sign, didn't I? I went in the wrong direction. I didn't listen. I didn't want to be wrong. You know, my situation was that I was in Utah because of the choice that I made. Judy was in Utah because of the choice someone else made, me. Our passenger was in Utah because she didn't want to get involved for one. Number two was her choice to get in the car with us, two, and the choice that I made again, three. And there could be some other reasons. But we find ourselves in Utah when we wanted to be in California. That was our situation. So when we look at this particular story, th th there's a message that we could probably draw from that. And I just put down a few of the message that one might select from this particular story. First of all, as far as my position goes, I was a know-it-all. Hey, you can't tell me anything because I know what I'm doing. Uh, I didn't want to listen. And I had this weird type of imagination. Some people would call it, uh, uh, you know, with the people of the conspiracy theory type of people, or either I just lied. Judy's situation, her, the reason she was in Utah was maybe because of her trust and attitude. She trusts me to get to Vegas, so she trusted me to get out of Vegas. And she had this trust, and because of that trust, her choice was to get in the car. That was her choice to get in the car, even though she had some other choices, might not have been a lot, but she chose to get in the car with me as I was going to bring her back to California. But once she got in the car, her choices became very small. She became what maybe we call captivated, so to speak. The thing is, is that she's in the car and her choices was probably taken away from her as far as what she could do at that time. I'm talking about lawful choices now. And we look at that and we look at the world today. There's times when we are going to be at a stage in our life where we can't make choices, important choices of what's going to happen to us because that we will be at an age where that choice might have been taken away from us. Our passenger, because she didn't want to get involved, I guess we can look at a few of uh, uh, the message that we can get from her. First of all, uh, let someone else make the decision. I mean, the people that we know about that, I don't want to get involved. Let somebody else make, and whatever decision that is made, I'm going to follow that decision. That was our, message that we could get from our passenger. But our situation and other situations can shape our attitude. 
if we look at it, trials are a normal part of our life. Uh, how one choose to respond to the difficulties that can usually be traced back to our attitude. When we accept, or we can accept our situation, our circumstance, we can accept that as how things are. But we don't have to accept how things have to be. And when we take that approach, we provide a strong foundation of being positive in our attitude. Despite all of the bad things, the difficult things around us, we can look at it in a positive light. We can see the good things. When we look at Paul, Paul accepted his circumstances and things, how things, and not how they had to be. Paul's circumstances was that he wrote a letter to the Philipp to, uh, uh, to Philippi. And he, at that time, he was in jail. He was in prison. And so Paul had a right to have a certain type of attitude. Uh, Paul, when we look at Philippians chapter 1, uh, we see regardless of his circumstances, Paul had a positive attitude. Put in jail for doing things that we would consider uh, a person that we would like to be around. Paul taught people how to be fruitful and caring and loving and kind and considerate. And, 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 we, and uh, through the gospel, how one is to save their souls. That was his primary position in life. And he was put in jail for that. But he kept a positive attitude. He expressed his gratitude to the church and he expressed his gratitude uh, to God for helping him have the right attitude in Philippians 1, 3 through 8. Because of the attitude that Paul had in his circumstance, in his situation, he saw that and was emboldened. They preached the gospel. And there was those that had different motives, but the gospel was being preached because of Paul's attitude that they saw. He expressed his hope that the church would grow more and more in knowledge in uh, 9 and 11 of the first chapter of Philippians. He instructed the church to avoid things like complaining and disputing. He encouraged them to comfort each other in love. Paul had a right to complain. He had such a positive attitude. Complaining can become a part of our everyday life that we lose a picture of what we should be doing. Paul teaches us when we are unable to change our condition, change our attitude. God is in control, a very familiar and a phrase that we all have heard or even probably said on many occasions. And most of us, if not all of us, believe in that particular phrase. God is in control. But we have to properly apply that phrase to our life. For example, if we're in a building and that building is on fire, God has provided you with the ability to choose to stay in or come out. God has provided for you. If a fire alarm go on, it telling you the building is on fire. Get out of that building. And if you sit in that building and you says, no, I'm gonna stay in because God is in control. You've lost the meaning of what this phrase means. God will provide in Genesis 22 and 8 is a phrase that we're going to be looking at. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide. 
let's look at this phrase in a very, very large sense. God has blessed us with so much. As the song that Kennedy song, Count Your Blessings. And especially with this broad knowledge of the world we live in. I mean, we can do so much. I was listening to Vera in the, before we got started. And she started talking about the, the, the ability to do certain things that medical people can do. And that's what they're going to be doing. And a lot of things that I'm just, I, I get amazed at how men have done so much. How broad the knowledge are in this world that we live in. We're able to accomplish so much because of the knowledge God has blessed us with. Some individuals have an interest in a specific study, studies, and, 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 and they have risen to the top of their field. They have got doctor's degrees and they have gone through all of these studies and they know so much about that field. Uh, we refer to them as what? Experts in that field. But some people don't give God credit of their success. Uh, there was one young lady after finishing school with a very high degree, uh, the top of the line. And she heard someone say, thank God. Her reply was, God had nothing to do with this. This was all my hard work. I stayed up late at night. I went to work. I came, got up early in the morning. I studied. I went to school. I made a lot of sacrifices. That was all on me. God had nothing to do with this. I want to look at this phrase. I want you to consider some of the following. What do you think of these statements that I'm about to put up? And whatever you're thinking is, I would like for you to think also, does the Bible support that type of thinking? One of the phrases I like to just, for your consideration, is it useless or meaningless to worship virtual, virtual as, we, as we do? Uh, how do you understand Matthew 18, 20? What the Bible says, for where two or three gathered in my name, there am I with them. Do you believe God has provided knowledgeable individuals in our life to warn and to transfer, to transform, or to inform us to the danger we face both physically and spiritually? We know in the Bible. We know God has provided certain individuals in the Bible for the uplifting and upbuilding of his kingdom. Do you think that also happened in the physical sense? Do you believe when God put individuals in our life to warn us about physical harm, that we should just ignore these warnings because God is in control and what happens, happens? Or do you believe we are following man and not God by not worshiping at a building in one place? Do you believe that we are being forbidden to worship? These are just consideration questions and topics that floats around, and we would encourage you to consider them in your study. Let's look at our assembly. Let's consider some of the teaching from the Bible. First of all, an assembly is referred to both physically and spiritually. It's a physical and spiritually gathering. Hebrews 10, 25 addresses both of those. We are to encourage each other, that's spiritual. We know we can gather physically and not be there, phys uh, be there. we can gather physically and not be there spiritually. Some people come to the assembly and sit down and take no part in the spiritual portion of the service. So if we want to be active in the Lord's church, it has to be driven by, the spirit, by our spiritual behavior. And if it's driven by our spiritual behavior, that will drive 
the, our physical behavior. I put this passage of uh, uh, scripture and I put a lot of different versions up there, but they all say the same thing. John 6, 63. It says the spirit gives life, but the flesh counts for nothing. In the spirit, when we come together, as we do, we share in the same script, scriptures. We're, we sing the same songs. We, we, we're sharing the same prayers. We, we share and being encouraged and edified from the same message. And so Philippians 3 and 3 tells us that in the spirit, we worship God. God did not want us to be physically isolated. We agreed to that with each other. But misfortunes happen. Things happen in our lives. Paul was isolated from God, but God provided a way for him. Uh, Paul was isolated from the church there in uh, Philippi. But God provided a way for him to keep going as he provides a way for us to keep going. God provided a way for Paul and the church to encourage each other when they were physically separated. And you know what it was called? It was what he provided for them was a letter. And this letter, you can look at it as their technology of their days. God provided someone the knowledge to develop this type of communication. He provided them with the material to develop this type of communication. When you look at how uh, the Bible was uh, handed down and shared, it's interesting to see the the things that God has provided upon this earth and the knowledge that he has given men to be able to do that. When we read the book of Philippians, we see the joy and encouragement they shared from this type of technology, a letter. I mean, it's outstanding and it's, it's encouraging. Uh, the spiritual connection that we have when we come together is encouraging. And it's because of the spiritual relationship we have developed with each other. I enjoy this time with my brothers and sisters. I'm encouraged and edified from the spiritual connection and the visual connection that we have. When a person have a spiritual connection with someone, you have a different attitude. We're not together physically in one place, but we are spiritually. And until we show and share with each other spiritually is just priceless. Let's not downplay our assembly and worship during these times. Let us continue to show our love and our concern for others and saving souls. Our worship service is not meaningless. Our worship services is not useless because we can't gather in a building. I'd like to close, begin my closing remarks with a principle teaching Jesus, a principle teaching of Jesus. When misfortune happens and we are doing that which is good, he's with us, making our services to him priceless. In Matthews 12, 1 through 11, there are some situations here. And we'll, let's, let's look at that. It says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields of the, on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pick some heads of grain and, and eat them. And so when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. And he answered, haven't, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry. He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the concentrated bread, which was not lawful for him to do, but only for the priests. Well, haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrated the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here 
if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went to, into their synagogues, and a man with a, sh a shriveled hand was there, looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus, and he said to them, if any of you have a sheep and it falls into a pit of the, on the Sabbath, would you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Luke 14, 1 through 5 says, on one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a very prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. And there in front of him was a man suffering some abnormal swelling in his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal them or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man's hand, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of your child, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Jesus says, misfortunes happen. And when they do, we need to do what is good. Philippians 1, 14 through 16 tell us that there's an app that that there's an app there's a there are things sometimes that are bigger than the problem. Let us not get caught up, caught up in this cold times of our world, especially during this time of politics and others. Let us continue to do good and let us keep our thoughts on what is bigger than the problem. There might be some in our gathering this morning that would like to know how you become a member of God's church, of Christ's church. The Bible tells us that we need to be John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I tell you, whosoever hear my words and believe him who sent me has eternal life, and I will not come unto judgment. Indeed, he has crossed over from death to life. We need to believe Hebrews 11 and 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who approach him must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder for those who seek him. Then repent, Luke 13 and 3. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish. Confess Jesus Christ. Acts 8, 37 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And then we have to be baptized. Acts uh, 38. I think it was 238. I might have left it to you. Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin and you will receive the gift. Thank you, and now the lesson is